Hello, so if you're watching this, you're probably thinking of joining the Royal Air Force, aren't you? It's a big commitment to make, and as shown by the title, um, this is literally a step by step guide of how to get through the RF basic training at Holton. Modernised, brand new. I've just been through it. I finished in January this year, and I haven't seen a lot of like clear good advice on the internet or anything like that. The best advice really I've seen is on Reddit, um, but there's no sort of explanation properly of how to to get through it and the things that you'll do during it. And I know a lot of it is kind of meant to just come around as a surprise, but for a lot of people, um, that surprise really knocks them off. And to be honest, it gets stressful enough. So I'm really hoping that this video might provide some value to your life, especially if you're like a week away or a few days and going into basic training and you really want to know um, what goes on there, just so you can have you know a little one up and just make it that bit easier because that really, really helps and that it will make your life 10 times easier. Trust me, I wish I had something like this before going on. Um, I know the RAF have posted something on their YouTube channel with uh, little like one minute snippets of the weeks, the, all the 10 weeks of the training. Um, but I didn't really find that helped too much because I didn't really understand uh, any of what was going on. And to be honest, a lot of it was in reverse order. So to kick off, you get there on the first day, okay? Uh, park up you've got the here we go to the block you're shown to that's where you'll be staying for the next 10 weeks or so for your course you have drop all your stuff down on the bed space you're allocated it's all shown to you in like the foyer of when you walk in where you are um and then it's essentially straight to the briefing room you get your first brief i was filling out a bit of paperwork and then the rest of the day is essentially being shown around camp, shown where everything is, uh, then you go to like the mess for dinner. Whether you enjoy the food there or not, that's your opinion. Um, there's a lot of 50 50, the reason I think most people don't really like it, I don't really enjoy it personally, but it is what it is. Um, trust me, you'll need the scram during this course because <laughs> you'll be knackered like all the time. Um, yeah, so essentially, once that's all done, you'll have a bit of labelling to do, some forms more to fill out in the evening, and then essentially, yeah, the rest of the evening's yours. I would use this time to get a thorough night's sleep, a good eight, nine hours, whatever floats your boat, because the nights coming definitely from this day, uh, they'll, you, they'll be a lot longer, you won't get as much sleep. So that's like day zero zero, that's the first day you get there. So day one is the first day of, it's, you have the fitness test and I believe you would test on that day as well. So essentially we, my flight did the fitness test in the morning. It's really piss easy, it's like a walk in the park. It's just the score that you need to do on the bleep test. If you pass the PJFT quite recently before uh, going on to training, um, it should be a walk in the park for you, and then it's just the uh, press ups and sit ups, the same number you did in the PJFT as well. Um, if you've done that, you'll then go on to a testing. So you're essentially going to this building, uh, you'll be led into this room, and you'll stand there and you'll repeat uh, these words that are basically being told to you, and that is you were testing to either, it's your choice, the king or god. I attested to the king, but of course it's entirely up to you. Uh, that's one of the actual few choices you do get to make during a halting, which is rather nice. Um, and yeah, then after that, congratulations, you are officially a member of the armed forces. You have to then commit to 28 days. If you really want to leave after then, you can, but you have to do the 28 days. They do, I did find they really did drum it into us on the first day actually, before we tested if you want to leave, now's your time to go and do it. Uh, and to be honest, it actually made me think about leaving, but I think that was purely because of 
the way they were like, oh yeah, if you want to leave, like say it now, say it now, say it now. I don't think that helps. A few tips for the first few days then. Um, obviously they they can be some of the hardest days of the course. They definitely were some of the hardest days for me to start off with, uh, just because um, I was so used to being at home. Like so, I was very very homesick during the first few days. Um, definitely get talking to as many people as you can because uh, these are the guys you're going to be with for hopefully the next 10 weeks provided they're nice people um, yeah and um, take plenty of water as well to your lessons sash briefs because you'll be not used to these kind of late nights early mornings that you'll be doing to get the block ready for inspection and stuff in the morning um, you're going to be extremely, extremely sleepy. I was. I think everyone was on my intake. Water is an absolute lifesaver, trust me. It keeps you awake and it keeps you somewhat focused to however much it can. I still find myself trying not to drift off a few times. Uh, I remember we had a brief in the evening in uh, the building called the Gap Sea, which is where you get a lot of your briefings near the start of the course. And uh, you'll find that it it's got like a cinema kind of atmosphere and you know if you've been in one of those uh, it's so easy to fall asleep high roof, dark room, wide uh, comfy chairs and you can barely hear the person speaking at the front <laughs> so I just I found myself drifting off quite a few times there were so many people that had to stand up and go to the back just to keep themselves awake um, so yeah that's another tip actually if you find yourself falling asleep basically just stand up and just go to the back because they they don't, the instructors don't mind that, but they don't particularly take kindly to falling asleep. Um, so that is, that was day, day two. Now, this is onto the rest of my one, starting with day two. So day two is definitely one of the most memorable because this is where you get all your military kit. So you go there early in the morning, you're measured up uh, on everything like feet, chest, shoulders, uh, torso, legs, and you get 95% of your kit uh, the kit at least that you'll need for the whole of the course anyway you'll get that on day two um, it's quite it's very long as well because it's just a matter of trying on all these uniforms to see if it fits you've got all these packages and stuff on the floor with bags and you're, you're fumbling for it because you've got absolutely no idea what you're finding and trying to fit on uh, so uh, not to mention the couples love to play a game with you uh, which seems to be called how long can it take for you to get dressed we had to guess and if it took us any over we kind of owed them some time but to be honest they completely forgot about that at least two hours later anyway so that's fine if they do that with you don't take it personally just uh, play the game which I'm sure you've maybe heard or been told already and that's a very common theme throughout the basic training anyway um, as soon as you get into the wider wrath um, it playing the game it's really not a thing which is nice because otherwise I probably wouldn't be here <laughs> um, after that you've got the fun of lugging all your kit back out to the coach and that's uh, a massive like deployment bag that you've got with all the kit stashed in you get like a, a military field day sack as well which I still use and take to work with me it's very good and three boxer shoes you've got your two sets of parade shoes number ones number twos and your boots as well which go with your greens that's all the fun of that and that is day two you'll have quite a long evening as well sorry I forgot to mention where you're basically just labelling all your kit uh, I wouldn't say you need to label it maybe all in the evening but just do a bit at least every day and just get it done because there is a ton of kit in. you will need to label it prior to the, the inspections because they do check to see if it's labelled so for the rest of the course essentially it consists of theory leading up to your general service knowledge which is your first pass fail exam and that's at the end of mob 1 uh, loads of fizz uh, kit prep as well which I barely took any of it in because I was again just trying not to fall asleep um, and you do a progress inspection as well it's 
I mean, yeah, the the drill and stuff like that is where you do that. You might find yourself doing it one day over the weekend as well, and that's like the one day over the weekend you're going to be working from what I remember, which is nice the rest of the weekends are yours. Drill is all right to start with, it gets tedious so, and they really try and they really knock it into you from the get go. You're in basically ranks of three, so like three lines of people and you're walking, you're walking around the camp. Uh, the instructors walk you around until you essentially pass the drill assessment which is after a few weeks in uh, and you basically have to repeat left right left every two seconds it's really quite embarrassing at times you have to show you like left right left <sighs> um, but yeah it, it gets used to the cadence and it it's definitely something that people pick up with but it takes a while especially to for everyone to be in step people were constantly changing step it was actually getting rather annoying at times <laughs> um, but looking back on it it's all quite funny you'll have three progress tests in the run up to the final test so that it gets used to the kind of questions you'll be getting uh, you get taught all of the theory and stuff it's really quite basic all of the tests are multiple choice so think of your GCSE four mark questions uh, sorry, one mark questions, four question multiple choice, it's very similar to all those. In the final test, I'm no academic genius or anything, but I got all the questions right. So that just proves there that it's really not hard to pass. 50 out of 50, easy, well up, on to the next bit. Fizz, on mod one, you get introduced to all this gym drill and stuff like that which is honestly some of the most petty shit I've ever come across. Uh, I'm sorry PT staff, but it's what it is. When you're having to do a jump to come to attention, you're kind of questioning life, you know. Um, but no, I think the most memorable lesson PT I had in Mob 1 was the, the first aerobic run that we did. It was literally a run up a fucking goddamn hill. I think I did... I had to do eight and a half kilometers. I put myself in the top group for whatever reason. Um, I am very much into my fitness, but like I'm not like a runner or anything. I'm more of a weightlifter kind of uh, CrossFit sort of person. Not really a runner. I found myself lagging out the back for most of the time during that. It was awful. <laughs> so I moved myself down to the second group. I didn't even tell the PT staff if you if they remember me. Sorry, I had to do it. I've got to conserve my energy somehow. <clears throat> the progress inspection um, is really not anything to worry about too much. The only one that's a real worry I'd say is the final inspection, but that's over in Mob 3, that's for another day. You get inspected in your greens. Uh, they basically just check. You can iron your stuff. Your bed space is cleaned. That's a massive one. Uh, you've ironed your bed correctly and your shoes are getting up polished to a decent standard. You'll get a lot of time to polish it, stop polishing your shoes as well. Um, quick tip for the shoes is the more brush layers you put on, the more they're gonna shine when you pull them. Uh, but we'll, we'll come to that. And yeah, essentially that is mod one. Uh, on the final day, obviously it's the, the final general service knowledge exam like I said it's really easy to pass um, in terms of the topics covered I've got listed here um, you basically literally get taught the RS core values uh, essential that you learn all the paperwork numbers uh, that come in the form of a JSP um, health and safety air power pain allowances career structure and general military discipline skills they're all the categories a bit of like aircraft recognition as well and they come under all the categories that you need to learn. Um, it's really not too much and it does sink in quite easily. It's a lot to take in at first because obviously again it's very new uh, but it requires a little bit every night is my best tip and you'll smash it. End of mod 1 uh, comes with a really well deserved rest and you'll get your first spell of local leave as well which is essentially 
the first one is six hours away from the base out hall to my mum came and saw me for and I spent the day with her really nice just to see her to get off the base and have a little breather especially after going through like a good I think five weeks of just like intense like getting up early making your bed every morning going to bed late having to meet all these timings and stuff which you do get better at doing um, and trying to bond with all these new people which is a lot easier for some than others I definitely found it quite tough because a lot of the people that seem to join the forces I've noticed are from sort of the Midlands North Way I am very much down south uh, south east west side is near Brighton um, but yeah no that is mod 1 ok so on to mod 2 uh, mod 2 is probably the most memorable of all the mods in terms of the content it comes with and some of the things you have to do on it so mod 2 is dedicated to initial force protection training so you're going to spend four weeks now with the RF regiment and they will teach you CBRN skills to weapons handling and first aid at work pretty much slash in the field and it gets consolidated with a field exercise for a week five days starting off we did the CBRN which is the chemical biological radiological and nuclear drills so we were issued on the first day of it uh, I think we were issued with our like helmet uh, the respirator which is like a gas mask heat on it protects you from like hazardous gases so if you end up having a if you end up coming under some sort of mustard gas attack which is, is somewhat likely these days but stuff like that it still does happen if you get deployed from what I've heard um, it's there to save you and protect you so you go through that you start learning all the drills and then one of the more infamous experiences of the training which I still remember very well is your initial exposure and that is quite literally being put into a gas chamber with all your kit on you have to take the, the helmet and the respirator off uh, oh no not the helmet sorry you don't wear that in there uh, the respirator though you do take off it's fine for about for me at least it was fine for about 10 seconds and then I was kind of like <laughs> It, it was horrible, it really was. It was even worse when you get kicked out of the room as well because it just it hits you, it completely floods your eyes. You, you feel like you're just going to project from it. Um, it's horrible and that is tear gas. So if you've seen on the news of like when the Liverpool fans got attacked in the Champions League final a couple of years ago uh, with tear gas, that's essentially what you have to stand in there with so it's not a particularly pleasant experience because you can't just run away um, <laughs> you're kind of made there to stand and kind of take it in a bit um, <clears throat> uh, the corporal me basically just got me to have my name, my service number, my trade and an interesting fact about me I got all the way through it and then I just stopped breathing sorry about the noise some of the other things that you expect to do when you get done to the IFPT the regiment corporals they put on a bit of a friendly face to start with but they seem to come down very strict on you like after a couple of days into it at least um, I seem to remember them saying from this moment forward you are to move with a sense of urgency run around the IFPT home and you're like oh my God, because you're in your greens, you're in this boiling hot hangar that seems to have these like massive radiators on the top. We were doing it in winter, mind you, and they were just blasting with heat. So it was it was so hot in there, my feet were absolutely just melting. Um, let alone we have to run around to like reenact being on a battlefield. Um, unless we've eaten, I think the hour after you've eaten, you have to you get to march around. But other than that, you've basically got to run it everywhere. You've got to double it, is what they call it. Um, they do inspections with you as well, so you have to lay all your stuff out in front of you when you get in. In like a certain order, they give you like only five minutes to do it. You have to run, like fill up your bottle to the, the top of the bottle, literally to the top. You have to show it to them, for example, which I don't really understand why you have to do stuff like that. 
Uh, keeping a respirator clean, obviously, that's a given. That's important. I understand that. Um, but yeah, no, that's just again, it's just playing the game, really. Um, it all serves a purpose at the end of the day. And I'm sure the regiment corporals have a method to their madness. Um, but no, they do. It does grow on you and that's just kind of the way it works so after your initial exposure the next couple of days you're taught the rest of the drills that you'll be assessed on and this is the next pass fail assessment of basic training and that is the CBRN drills so it does take quite a while to learn because you are essentially given and you borrow uh, a full light hazard protection suit it's like a coat and overlay trousers uh, boot covers that you have to pull on that seems to take me forever as long because it was so damn tight uh, and like two sets of gloves as well as like white gloves and then these black rubber gloves massive ones over the top where you literally cannot feel a thing you reckon them so you're literally trying to use muscle memory in these drills with all of this kit on uh, to work through it um, I was actually convinced I was going to get reflyed on this because it literally took me up to the night of practicing just relentlessly to understand it plus you have a 10 question theory test as well and you have to learn all of this theory yeah, you're getting taught on the side as well about CBRM but the worst of it I think was definitely the practical because uh, I wasn't very good with it to start with um, but no it's all it's all very interesting stuff actually is CBRM it's one of the more interesting parts of the courses assessment day comes around you do the kind of the drills uh, bit by bit you get three attempts at it um, if you don't pass on the third attempt for one of the drills unfortunately you get reflighted um, which isn't ideal at all and luckily I didn't get reflighted during CBRN because that would have been a nightmare once that's done uh, get a weekend again off which is very nice um, and after that it is on to the rifle training so there were some really cool bits actually about the rifle training learning the theory and learning the parts of the gun I found quite tedious and I was again trying not to fall asleep fill your water bottle up, drink plenty of water, eat plenty of food to keep your energy um, trust me you really need it um, I'm going to reiterate it because it's so so important once you've done that and you've learned all of the weapon theory, again there's a 10 question theory test as well as a weapons handling test on the Enfield L85 rifle. Um, you then get to go out on the range. Uh, the ranges are pretty cool. You get to fire live rounds, uh, you get to do plenty of it. And um, yes, yeah, it's a really interesting experience, especially if you haven't fired off a rifle before. There you go, you get to do that. The L85 has like two settings on it, so it's got like a, a semi auto just a repeated setting where uh, the, f the bots just come out once you've pulled the trigger one by one, or it's an automatic setting, and that's pretty self explanatory. You also do a electronic range shoot, which you don't actually fire live rounds, but it's kind of simulated. When I did it, it wasn't a pass fail thing for getting reflighted but there was a pass in fact but you have to do it every year anyway uh, to keep your competency up apparently now it's a, a reflight thing you get assessed on it which I find mental because the way the computer worked it was just so rigged against you like you couldn't hold the rifle steady it was it was way too heavy compared to what an actual rifle was um, and yeah, that was that is that for the rifles. Uh, you also learn how to, after you put it together, you learn how to strip it down, clean it every day. You'll be doing it every day on Exercise Blue Warrior, which is the CPT at the end of the module. Um, again, bit of a learning curve, but hey, we get through it. And you don't have to do it again after that. The rifles are only meant to be cleaned once every month, I think it is, unless you're firing off an absolute shit ton. But for the purposes of basic training, you have to clean it every day. Um, 
But no, the the range and that was good fun. Learn the rifle was probably the best bit of RFPT actually. So yeah. Uh, first aid is the next week, and this is only coming around now to the end of RFPT, and just sort of about halfway through basic training now anyway. So first aid is definitely the easiest week in terms of the theory and the practical because you're basically learning just how to do the recovery position, CPR, and then it's a load of theory on the side of it, like burns, electronic shocks, um, that cardiac arrest and stuff like that, you'll learn how to do that. And again, it's a pass-fail thing with 10 questions and a small little practical. Once you've done that, it is then on to the last week. However, during the first aid week, you have, I think it's three uh, functional green PT sessions. You'll have had a couple in the run up to that as well, where you're doing fizz in your greens outside with the helmet on, and you're doing like practical stuff. So you end up doing stuff like leopard crawls, bear crawls, um, runs of like a stretcher. Um, I thought, what was it else? Uh, like presses and like sit ups of like a sandbag. Um, a human sandbag carries as well. Uh, this one's where you carry your partner and stuff as well. So it's all, it's all very unique in terms of exercise. It's all very functional as well. So that was actually quite enjoyable at times as well, except for the cold, of course. That was not very nice. Um, for the three final ones, you do a booted run. So again, that is just upgrading your stamina to running up the hill again in your boots and your greens, and that's pretty rats. Uh, you do a stretcher run as well through the woods and then back onto camp which was a, a really good test of teamwork as well that was one of the more fun bits of fizz actually uh, you're literally running with a weighted 80 kilogram stretcher and a team of like there's eight people carrying it and you're running behind the PTI instructor um, very like high adrenaline kind of stuff it was absolutely piercing it down with rain that day as well so it just made it even more like, action packed kind of thing it was crazy uh, and then, of course, you do the, the last functional fifth session as well. So the weekend, running up to Blue Warrior, you'll get taught on the Friday how to essentially pack stuff like your sleeping bag into your book and you get uh, to borrow a bit of this kit, which will be taken on the CPT with you next week. And you have the weekend to pack it all and to pop it in the truck, uh, it's a rather mean looking truck actually, which is parked up on the parade square, a few intake to pop the bags in uh, during the weekend. So, on to the Blue Warrior Day, you're probably knackered by this point anyway, so I've, when I've spoken to other people, they're literally like, I don't even know what I'm doing, I'm just getting on a coach and we're being taken somewhere. <laughs> Uh, I was following the course content quite thoroughly so I knew exactly where we were going I pretty much knew exactly what we were going to be doing um, <clears throat> in the morning with Blue Warrior you march down to the RFPT hangar as usual you'll get shown basically how to properly pack the Bergen again um, and you have to lay everything out in front for your section corporals to come and check that you have everything that you need which is I guess rather useful you've basically packed it to the absolute brim now uh, you've got like three sets of greens uh, like your mess tins your webbing everything like that um, you also have a rifle with you for the whole time and then yeah and you're given like one of them little things which stop the rounds from actually coming out the rifle and they just drop out the chamber which is pretty useful but it's so stiff and it's a nightmare to try and get on uh, bear in mind you have to take it off every day for the inspection to when you're stripping down the rifle which is great fun now so you're on the coach um, you get a bit of time to rest on there which is all right if you can kind of mitigate the nerves of going to Bramley training area which is where you do Blue Warrior once you're off, you're basically, from the get-go, you start your lessons in the field, you dropped off at the coach, and you sort of walk along to this hangar, which is where you'll be rallying up every morning, near where you're camping out uh, in your sections, 
Uh, you get taught how to kind of do a patrol. Uh, we do it in a staggered patrol. I don't know, I'm no expert on this. <laughs> Just trying to explain it the best I can. Once you get there, it actually happens to be colder inside this hangar than it was outside. And bear in mind, it was absolutely fucking freezing. I was freezing my nuts off during the whole thing. On the same day, you basically learn how to prepare your rations and stuff that you're given at IFPT. You get one 24-hour ration bag a day. I think they're worth, like, I've looked up, they're 24 quid. The food in the ration pack is actually better than the food in the mess. But bear in mind, the, the field rushes are actually quite nice, especially if you cook them. Um, I've still got a few in my cupboard now from like ages ago because I like them that much. <laughs> um, so you're taught how to put a bivy sheet up and stuff as well, and that will be what you're sleeping under in your sleeping bag for the next four nights. During Blue Warrior, you actually get more sleep than you do when you've been back at camp. They actually give you more sleep, which is lovely considering on the Monday morning, I think our intake were up at about 4.15, cleaning the block, making our beds, and then off to breakfast, and then straight down to the armory to pick up the rifles, and then down to IFPT. Uh, we get up at like, I think we got up at about 6.30 on the first morning to be in the hangar at seven. Then when we had to pack all of our kit up, in our Bergens, walk it round to the hangar, and then we had a little brief, and then basically we had the first like morning admin when we had to go out, breakfast, wash your stuff, wash yourself, brush your teeth, fill your water bottle up, strip and clean the rifle, you do this in an hour and a half, I could have keep up with it, I don't know how the hell I made it through, but hey there we go, it might have just been the tiredness sort of stress of it, here we go. Um, sorry. Ah, yes. <laughs> on the first day, so we got absolutely beasted on the first day because we had this methods of movement thing, which is essentially you're taught how to leopard crawl with a rifle. Uh, with the webbing on and everything like that, uh, we had to do this tuck and roll. Uh, oh, what was it? We had to do leopard crawls, bear crawls, um, bloody everything. Uh, yeah, that was quite physically taxing because they line us up, they rally us up around this like orange square. Uh, we'd have to run like all the way around it down to these jerry cans, which I put like 50, 60 meters down the field, run to them, run round, run back and then stop and get ready to then dive down and crawl from one side to the other. I still remember it vaguely, it was very, very tiring. <laughs> um, not to mention, after a few times we've run around, they started letting off smoke bombs as well. And essentially, every time they let a smoke bomb off, we'd have to drop down to the ground and start leopard crawling until they say clear, and then we got up and ran back. Uh, the first time I had to do the job, I was above... I kid you not, a literal mud puddle, they dropped it, I had to drop down and I just went splat. <laughs> not a great start especially because I wanted to kind of keep, keep my kit clean, luckily it didn't rain during the week but that was rat. <laughs> oh dear, I remember just how muddy it was and how cold it was and the gloves they give you as well, they're absolutely fucking useless, they really are, they don't keep you warm at all. One recommendation I'd make in terms of if your hands kind of naturally get cold, a bit like mine in the winter, get some sort of underlayer like white glove, whack them on, and then whack the other gloves on top. You have two solid layers, then hopefully your hands shouldn't fall off. I do seem to remember doing the methods of movement where we had to take all our warm kit off. One of the lads actually lost feeling in his hands, and he was he was standing there. And he was like almost in shock and had to like rush him inside and get him warmed up and stuff. So luckily they do look out for you in that sense. There is a sense of health and safety even though it might not seem like it. <laughs> um, for the rest of the week then, yeah, we do med carries on the Wednesday. There's more lessons in the field so it's kind of like all camo concealment which is pretty cool. Uh, 
battle tactics, something I didn't quite understand because it involved running towards the enemy, but you felt pretty cool while you were doing it, uh, especially if you're getting like them reactions spot on. And then on the first day, you do like a consolidation of it all, um, and you put it all into practice. Not pass fail, but still really interesting, and that was definitely the best day of it. And then the Friday, you do the the morning admin, you pack up, and you go out to camp. The final bit of mod two essentially is a couple of awards get presented out of RFPT, uh, and then you march back up to the top as you've been doing. Uh, check the rifles, clean of ammo, put the rifle back. You march back your block and then it's the weekend you do a quick post like exercise check just to make sure you haven't lost anything and you've managed to clean everything and that is the end of mod 2 so the next part of the course is a trip to Wales and it is to the Robson Resilience Centre at Krakow a lovely place in the Brecon Peak it's absolutely beautiful um, it's a place where basically every intake goes. Uh, during the time basic training, I think it's week it's week eight, straight after Blue Warriors, straight after the CPT check, you go there for a week. Uh, you learn plenty about yourself and it's just a week of basically resting up and doing a load of adventure training. It's great. It's probably the best week of the course, to be honest. And by that time, I think everyone is dying to get on it, especially after the four draining weeks of IFPT prior um, to this and this marks the start of your mod 3 um, which essentially getting to know yourself in graduation essentially the trip is it's about four hours um, it felt it felt like a palace it really did compared to Halton the food as well was ten times better the accommodation seemed a lot nicer as well even though we're still in um, the normal beds are still given the normal like RF bedding which is MOD it's like a white bed sheet and a blue um, duvet cover, weirdly enough, and like a white pillowcase. Um, but yeah, no, uh, we stopped for the service station as well, and it was the first time of a week, so I'd been able to grab something from the outside. So I took advantage of that, actually got myself a panini and a coffee from Starbucks. It was a 10 hour bit, it was, it was so worth it. Um, yeah, when you get there then, you get your AT, all your AT kit, so it's a bag and a load of like walking kit and it's all about dorsy stuff. Um, you do take your boots that you issue with you as well for the walking and the activities and stuff, uh, but that's really the only bit of kit you need. Um, you get given your bedding as well and then you then you go to your room and it's effectively a quick like safety brief for human factors and stuff, uh, a few environmental facts like heat on this cold injury and yeah the rest of the time is yours until the next day where you do your first activity. My group we did, uh, what was it, we did uh, like rock climbing, like indoor rock climbing and some abseiling, that was good fun. Uh, we did high ropes as well which is interesting, uh, we did and I did a hike on the Brecon Beacon as well. Like I keep saying for it, it was absolutely freezing, I was freezing my balls off the whole time but you know what, that walk up the Brecon Beacons was spectacular and the views were simply like incredible. Never been anywhere like it, never done a hike or anything like that before. So to be honest, it was one of the parts of the course that I was actually a bit more grateful <laughs> to be doing. Especially the kit as well, because it was really nice. It was worth quite a bit and it was obviously loaned to us for the week and we gave it back at the end. Um, I was meant to camp overnight but I was put on like a medical chip because it was cold weather or whatever and they seemed to have concerns about me for some reason. So unfortunately I missed the cave-in that my group did the next day as well. Don't know how that was, but I think I got the best of it, the best activities of the crop. So happy days for happy with that. Um, so that's the week at Crick Dumb. You go back the weekend, you get another bit of local leave. Nine hours this time. Uh, goes far too quickly as normal uh, and then the Sunday is essentially um, uh, something that everyone used as a prep day because next up is the final inspection this is probably the most dreaded part of the course 
in the opinion of probably everyone on the intake. It definitely was for me. We were briefed about it on the Friday as soon as we got back from Crick Owl. Um, and they basically went through all of the expectations of like the, the ironing and everything like that. Um, it really has does have to be done down to a T this in order to pass. So we have a few days to prep. Basically a little bit of the Saturday or even more if you choose to come back earlier. I didn't do that, maybe it was a mistake, I don't know. The whole of Sunday um, and a bit of Monday as well, I believe, like after the days ended, everyone stayed up till the Monday night of day 62 was horrendous because you do have a fitness test actually on day 62, I've just remembered as well. Uh, it's the exact same requirements as day one, it's basically just a test that your fitness hasn't dropped off during the time, which to be honest, I don't think. The fact that you have several PT sessions where you've had to get physically conditioned or whatever for Blue Warrior, nobody fails it. Trust me, it's a really easy pass. Walk in the park, happy days. It's still a pass fail though. Um, day 63 inspection, however, is 10 times tougher. I ended up failing it the first time round, so I had to redo it the next day. Failed that again, got recoursed. <laughs> Hard times, hard times, but then I redid it again and I passed it. I think I got like one minor on it, so there you go. Even if someone like me can pass it, you can definitely pass it. And if it's the day before the final inspection, you're watching this video at like 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning for a little bit of motivation, uh, this is your message for you to just push on and crack on and get through it and pass it because it's not worth doing it again stay up do whatever um once you get used to the ironing kit prep and you found out these little hacks and stuff that holton don't teach you uh, you can get a shirt done in like between five and ten minutes so so easy don't have to my tip for you in terms of being able to get through those blue shirts because i know that's the bane of everyone's life it was definitely the bane of my life Everyone has a habit of leaving it like aside on the ironing board after pressing it with the heat. You don't need to do that. Lift, pick it up, lift it up. Like don't move, don't actually physically move it. Just lift it up. Let some air get under it for a few seconds. Then you can move it around. Spray loads of water on it with your spray bottle. Make sure you have a spray bottle all times. If it breaks, get a new one immediately. That's a mistake that I made, and it cost me because it just makes it 10 times easier to iron everything. It just presses the creases out. It is a lifesaver. You don't have to wait for the shirt to like cool down or anything on the board. Just move it around pretty much a few seconds after you've done that side. Bosh, happy days. Um, definitely do dedicate a fair chunk of time. I dedicated, I think, at least an hour and a half to dusting out and sweeping up my locker and everything. and making sure my bed space was spotless because that is the most common thing. I think people get an immediate fail for us, hygiene fail, any dust picked up and they quite literally do go round on your locker and like that and they'll look at their hand. Luckily, no, it's not that bad lads army where they have the white glove on, you don't get beasted for it either. But it's, it's almost still like, I mean, it's almost alien to me now because I haven't had any dust, but you know, I, I sometimes do it as a prank on other people, just as a laugh. Um, it's what it is. You pass the final inspection, you're up till God knows how long, late at night. The next day you do actually have a PT session. Um, basically, pff, what, 98% of the intake don't get more than three, four hours sleep that night. So. Don't sweat it. They probably will cancel the lesson. They'll ask you if you slept. Just be honest. You might have like a little bollock in. Um, we did from a PT and pff, it's what it is. Do you know what I mean? A PT lesson. Missing one, you have to miss six to get reflied or something. You fell two final inspections and you reflied. I know what I'd rather gamble on, you know. Provided you pass that, it's then literally 
the rest of the week and a half you have is drill prep, prep learning how to draw the rifle, it's the run through of the final parade, it's the good stuff, it's the thing that you've literally been dying to get on since you've been there, since you've been seeing the, seeing the senior intakes on that parade square practicing, now it's you, like this is, this is literally your time. And it's probably the time as well where everyone's kind of the most motivated just to push through the course and just get it done. You know, because at this point, I think everyone just wants to finish. It's, it's that part. You've been through initial force protection training, you've been through the theory, you've been through the inspections. Now just get through this final little stage. Um, you've already tried your number one zone as well and have a few photographs taken out. Actually, on day 62, I've got to mention that. Um, you do have a few photos taken along the way of the the course of you by I don't know it's this photographer that seems to charge an arm and a leg for the photos you'll get someone I've PT as well holding the rifle which is pretty cool I got one of those and I've got one of the ones in my number ones um, on day 62 you also have an intake photo and a room photo on that day as well but yeah back to the rifle drill you learn a load of that you'll go through um, a few rehearsals you'll do like three practice ones where you're doing it like on your own kind of thing without any sort of pointers or guidance on the run up to the parade and then yeah before you know it the Wednesday day 72 is come around you graduate him you've got the parade square set up you've had your sat brief or whatever um, and it's like one o'clock and you're about to march onto a parade square in your number ones with your rifles, your family are there waiting to applaud you as you walk on. It is probably is the best day of basic training. Not only because you've you've got to the end, but you're celebrating with your family, your family are there watching you graduate. Um it's fantastic and if you get a fly pass as well, we had a Chinook. Uh, with one of the weapon systems operator guys like hanging at the back giving the crowd a wave which is pretty sweet maybe it's something I go on to one day we'll see um, but yeah no it's a, it's a fantastic day and it was, it's so good to be with the family again you know because after however many weeks unless you get some sort of leave because it's the king like some coronation or no, it's like a Christmas or summer break yeah there for like a good two months and if it's your first time moving away from home as well it's it's pretty challenging especially with the the long days the late nights the early mornings you know but you're there and if you do make it through give yourself a massive pat on the back because it, it truly is an achievement to get through it even even if it's only like oh um and basically it, no trust me it is like nothing you've ever experienced before and the satisfaction of getting into the end is something I think you'll remember for your whole career. After that, you you pack your stuff up and essentially yeah, you get to go home for a few weeks leave, which is nice. Um, now from here, you either come back on Sats for a week or a few, or you'll end up going straight to your Phase Two course and doing your specialist training for whatever trade you joined up as. Um, I joined as an Air Space Operations Specialist, so. I ended up on sets for a few weeks, like a month. Did two weeks hot and two weeks on holding at Cranwell. Um, so it's all right to see a different part of the breath there, actual flying station where they teach the trainee pilots for their elementary flying training. And then it was off to Shawbury for eight weeks and now I'm at posted at Swanwick. And I've been there for just over two months. But yeah, no, um, I hope this video was as joyful as it was to make it, um, I thoroughly enjoy it actually and I really hope it's provided some value and it's been a real eye opener into more what basic training is like. I could probably go on for hours specifically about the specific things that they've done, maybe for another day. Um, we'll see how it all goes. But yeah, if you're about to go on or you're applying, um, my best advice is just go for it just go for it, don't look back because uh, it it truly does develop you as a person thanks for watching goodbye